Good morning, everyone. And good morning to all the Zoomers out there. Zoomers is a real word, by the way, I've learned. We only have uh, one reading today, but it's long. Um, Joshua retold. What's retold? Well, telling a story again or, or differently. And I think you'll hear this as differently in a really cool way. Cool way, I guess that makes me old. And this is the sixth book in the Hebrew Bible, or if you prefer the Old Testament. It was written approximately 580 BCE, eh, plus or minus. Really wants to hear this, I guess. <laughs> we got a preacher here, I think. <clears throat> Joshua retold. After Moses died, his assistant Joshua felt called by God to lead these Israelites. His call, as he heard it, was to take them to the land across the River Jordan. This land was currently home to other people, but he heard the Lord tell him it was rightfully theirs. Joshua also heard God remind him to follow the Ten Commandments. To begin making a home in this land, Joshua set his sights on the first city, Jericho. This was the center of power and money. And so to take possession of the land meant first to take the possessions of the city. There was a thick stone wall built around Jericho, so thick that there were rooms inside it with windows that looked out both ways over the countryside and down the city streets. The wall had been there for thousands of years. From long ago, the rooms of the wall were built to hold grain. In those early times, people had not yet learned how to make pottery jars. They had no way of storing all the grain that they grew in their fields. So they brought it to Jericho and stored it in the city walls. Of course, the people who lived in the city liked this very much because they always had enough to eat without having to go into the fields and grow it. It gave them creativity because they could feed musicians, any musicians out there, and poets who entertained them. Many children and young people across the land longed to move to the city so they could enjoy these exciting activities. The grain also gave the city people power because they could feed soldiers. These soldiers could go out into the countryside and protect the people from danger, but they could also attack and hurt the people and force them to bring their grains to the city. And so in the days of Joshua, when it would have been possible to keep your own pots of grain, the people throughout the land nonetheless sent their grain to the city. They both admired and feared the city. Many people inside the city had mixed feelings too about it. Joshua sent two spies to learn everything they could about Jericho and the rest of the land he believed rightfully belonged to his people. The two spies entered the eastern gate of Jericho in the afternoon, trying to look casual, and went directly to the home of a woman named Rahab, who lived in the city wall. Rahab took them in and spent many hours with them. The gatekeeper hadn't recognized the two men, and he was suspicious. He sent word to the king, 
who also became suspicious. So the king sent soldiers to Rahab's house to get the visitors. When they knocked on the door, Rahab looked out the window and saw their fine clothes and not so concealed weapons. Although she had the sp- although she had although she and the spies had never met before that evening, she chose to protect them. While her sister chatted with the soldiers, Rahab quietly took the visitors up to the roof and hid them under some flax stalks. Then she came down to talk to the soldiers. Oh, those guys, she said. Yes, they were here, but they left hours ago before the city gates were closed. If you want to catch them, you'd better go quickly. The men working for the king believed Rahab and left to chase down the spies. Rahab went back up to the spies and said, I know who you are. I've heard the stories of how you and your people came from Egypt and how you've survived unbelievable odds. Here in Jericho, we're deathly afraid of you. Your success in battle means that the Lord, your God, is indeed God in heaven and above and on the earth below. I know you're here to plan to take our city and land, and I believe that you'll succeed. But I don't want to die. I don't want my family to die. So since I've been kind to you, will you protect me and my family when you come from the city or for the city, when you come for the city? The men said to her, our life for yours. If you do not tell on us, then we will deal kindly and faithfully faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. They arranged to her to hang a red string from her window so they could find her part of the wall when they returned. She then took them down to the lowest floor of her home with a window facing outside the walls and let them down by rope. The two men hid in the countryside for a few days and then carefully made their way back to Joshua. They told him, truly the Lord has given us all the land into our hands and all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before us. That ends the reading. Thank you, Jim. The story of the wall of Jericho and the decisive role played in its destruction by the woman who lives on top of it, writes landscape architect Thomas Ullis, is one of the best known in the Bible and it's easy to see why. There's something infinitely satisfying about the image of an impregnable edifice brought down by the sheer force of collective will. Reason enough that the walls came tumbling down is perhaps after good fences make good neighbors, the most common catchphrase about walls. But this morning, we are not telling the story of the wall's destruction. We are telling the story of the wall itself, recognizing it as one of the characters with a personality, a history, a rationale. Last month, Kayla told Thomas Olis story about how fences and hedges have taken over the landscape of Denmark, but only since the 1950s. In that short blink of history, Danes have become so accustomed to their enclosure that their walls are nearly invisible. At a time of increasing xenophobia and classism, 
this collective forgetfulness is symbolic of a great moral vacuum in which bad walls are built and sustained. So today, instead of taking walls for granted or hastily rushing to knock them down, we pause to look at them. The narrator in Robert Frost's poem, Mending Walls, did more than look at the wall in his life. He took into his hands the fallen stones, felt their roughness and weight, and chose over and over again in conversation with his neighbor to rebuild the wall. His inner thoughts were negative, complaining, griping, but wasn't he the one who picked up the phone and arranged the time to mend the wall? Did he not consent again this year to hear his neighbor's tedious refrain, good fences make good neighbors? As the poem's narrator engages in the physical and relational work of repairing the boundary between himself and his neighbor, he's drawn toward ethical reflection, saying, before I built a wall, I would ask to know what I was walling in or walling out. The ethics of the poem lie not in the answers to this question, because in any poem there is no answer, but in the question itself. Olas's book asks more question. Is the wall contestable, meaning do people know it's there and have the ability to protest it? Does the wall support ecology? Does the wall nurture? Under what conditions does a wall make good neighbors? It is a question for religious people, people who have come together within walls that we have built with intention to nurture our spiritual and intellectual lives so that we might do the work of love beyond them. We build physical and virtual walls to gather on Sunday mornings. We also build walls of principles, beliefs, creeds, commandments, covenants, expectations, words that clarify where we are in the landscape of human culture. As religious people, we have the ethical apparatus to hold in tension the deep human need to be bound together and the calling to be generous. We have specialized skills to build walls of support rather than walls of fear and greed, walls of inclusion rather than walls of exclusion. In 1648, New England Congregationalists wrote the Cambridge Platform, the foundation of the governance structure for both Unitarian Universalism and the United Church of Christ today. This wall has been modified, updated, transplanted in countless ways. And in 1984, the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations updated our bylaws, a descendant of that platform, to include a covenant among all UU congregations that we would affirm and promote seven principles. It's not a creed. You don't have to promise to believe anything. It is a promise for how we will behave, not a test for whether you can be in our walls. Ours is a living tradition. These walls are alive and adaptable. We reassess them every 15 years. And last month, the General Assembly of UU Congregations voted in favor of new bylaws. Instead of seven principles, we are coming 
to see ourselves shaped by seven values, which are interdependence, justice, equity, transformation, generosity, plurality, and at the center, love. Our 1984 principles and 2023 values are not inert rocks piled together as a barrier. They are alive, growing, changing. I guess our bylaws are more of a hedge than a wall. I'm not thinking of a simple bush you might plant to demarcate property lines. I'm thinking instead of the great hedges of the British Isles first formed 5,000 years ago. As described by Thomas Ollis, these hedges are, quote, a network of massive earthen banks seven feet high and over 15 feet wide, topped with boulders, shrubs, even trees, that divide the green slopes into small, irregular pastures. Following the rolling topography, disused banks extending like fingers onto the heath above, using little more than their hands, people pushed granite boulders into lines. When they encountered a boulder too large to move, they simply altered the course of the bank. These walls were an accomplishment no less great than the wall of Jericho, he continues. They demanded immense collective effort. That they were built across an entire landscape suggests how much they benefited the people who made them. Protecting flocks from predators and weather, so the people flourished. The walls thus embodied the possibility of human life and increase. End quote. 5,000 years later, these hedges remain benefiting the ecosystem as a whole, feeding a diversity of birds with a diversity of bugs, improving soil conditions, providing habitat for essential species, and providing corridors for the movement of animals. One of the elements of the UUA's 1984 bylaws that is sustained in our new version is our appreciation for the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. An element in the 2023 version that wasn't in the earlier one is our explicit commitment to anti-racism. Racial inequity is a huge boulder right in the middle of everything. We must alter the course of our boundaries in order to be a safer and more nourishing spiritual home. The bylaw change comes at a time when the UUA is deliberately dismantling white supremacy in our hiring practices and has increased staff of color. That we can do this at a time when affirmative action is being written out of law testifies to the power of religion for good. As we shape and reshape our boundaries in light of the wise demands of this generation, we ask in so many words, does this wall support ecology? Does this wall nurture? As Joshua led his people toward new ways of being, he might very well have asked these questions of the wall of Jericho and concluded, no. This wall does not support ecology, it does not nurture, it protects a military establishment designed to drain the people inside and out of their vital resources. But let us look at the behavior of the men he sent upon their encounter with the wall. They passed through the gates but stayed at the wall went inside the wall into the arms of Rahab. They spent several hours with her. The day passed into night, and they became close enough that she would protect them from harm 
and they would protect her. Did this wall nurture? Indeed it did. Of course, Joshua was not a landscape architect assessing a wall. He was a leader looking after his people, bound by the law of Moses and driven by the belief that the land, both inside and outside the wall of Jericho, belonged to them. I admit I find Joshua chapters 1 and 2 quite confusing. The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, are very clear that you should not steal, covet another's home, or kill. But somehow in Joshua's deep-seated belief in his people's birthright to the land on the eastern side of the Jordan, it makes him willing to lie and kill and take from others. The men he sends to Jericho to scope out all the land come back with one story about one night with a, a conversation with one woman, and they conclude, truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land melt in fear before us. It seems like a little bit of a stretch to me. What I love about the Jewish and Christian scriptures is that they have so many openings for questions. It is not our job to read the story and come to a final conclusion about what actually happened 3,200 years ago and was written several thousand years later. What I hear God telling me to do is to look at what happened to the people in these stories, imagine what was said and done but not recorded, and find inspiration for what we should do now. I admit that I envy Kayla and Melissa their lectionary, that schedule of scripture they can lean on to inspire their sermons. The Bible is an integral part of your structure, the Christian wall. You're not required to believe everything in the Bible. What would that even mean? But there is an agreement that when you come in these walls, you are bound to dialogue with the major and minor characters of these stories, to have a relationship with the wall, to ask it, questions. Your ethics lie not in the answers to these questions, because there is no one answer, but in the questions themselves. And as you intentionally engage with these walls, you make them visible. You make them contestable. You keep them alive. Many folks these days, including some who find their way to Unitarian Universalism have turned away from Christianity as a defense against harmful and abusive behavior and ideology masquerading as Christian. They reject white Christian nationalism, which claims to follow the laws of Moses and Jesus while rationalizing physical and legal attacks and exclusion of marginalized people and communities. Narrow interpretations of scripture are assumed to be fact, just a part of the landscape, the American landscape. These walls are intended to be invisible, uncontestable. We need you, good Christians of Manhattan, to remember the Christian history and tradition and contest these new dangerous walls. We need you to plant and water new seedlings in your ancient hedges and pull out the barbed wire. And we'll come over and help. And you might not need our help with the barbed wire, but I think you need us Unitarian Universalists who live in 
and within adjacent walls further down the migratory corridor, tending life in a different climate with different materials, but no less intention and care. We are following with you the first and greatest commandment, which is love. And the second, to love your neighbor as yourself. In our own ways, we are all embodying the possibility of human life and increase, providing safe haven for threatened populations, serving as essential corridors for the movement of people and ideas. Extractive economic forces have been thinning our hedges, turning the granaries of ancient cities into fortresses cutting across Bronze Age hedges with Industrial Age private property markers, chopping up Turtle Island with land grabs and broken treaties. But we can build and rebuild and maintain thick walls and hedges, live like Rahab in the walls restore and build new networks of walls extending like fingers into the areas that have been disconnected and isolated from care until they flourish across our entire landscape. It demands immense collective effort more than a single congregation or faith community can accomplish alone. Our ancient ancestors did this work with their bare hands, and no doubt, a lot of dialogue and debate. I don't know exactly how we'll do it, but let's do it together. <laughs>